So we're here. Uh, it is, it's been a long week for all of us. I know. I know it's been a long week. It's been a long week for me. Mr. Bruce Wilson in the house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. But uh, again, Reverend Mark Hughes, the executive director for my Racial Justice Alliance, and every now and then, how many people believe we just need to speak out? How many people believe that every now and then we need to say something? Have you ever been around something or something happening? I don't know, maybe like a political climate or some type of uh, racial rhetoric that's happening nationally. I'm just saying, uh, and things are just going by you all day long and you don't say anything for a week, for a month, for a year. What happens is, is that begins to normalize. How many people believe that begins to normalize a lot of the things that we're experiencing? The reason why we're here to speak out, for those of you who've come, for those of you who are wondering, the reason why we're here to speak out is, is because at some point or another, we just have to break the deafening silence of nonsense that's happening around us and just show up and say something about the insanity that we're experiencing and call wrong, wrong, and call right, right. So that's what we're here for. We're here to we're here to speak out. So there are some of you who who may have a couple of things to say about the topic at hand, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. If you do, then just feel free to go ahead and stop over and talk to our assistants. You can grab a card. I, ju I just want to get your name just so I can announce you. For those who are walking by, hi, I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. This is you just rolled up on a speak out, and we're just talking about something that you may want to hear about so if you want to just stop in and listen you're more than welcome and what this is all about uh, today is what we're, we're going to be talking about what I heard I don't know whether you heard it or not but just recently this week did you know that what happened was is that um, the um, the ACLU I got a call from the ACLU um, I think it was like the night before they the press release came out and um, and uh, the director said, hey, something's coming. And that's all he could really say. He said, something's coming, and I just want to let you know it's in your backyard. Uh, so, there's, so there it was. It came out that, that morning in the press release. It went back to something that happened here in Burlington, uh, probably right at about maybe it's a little bit around, I say it's around three years ago about three years ago. And I'm gonna give you just a short narrative. Um, and then uh, later I'm gonna, in, in just a couple minutes, I'm gonna read uh, parts of that press release. And if and as, as you hear this, um, I just, you know, the reason why we're calling it out is, is so we want, we want you to be able to process it. Um, then the other thing too, is I do have um, at least one statement for, uh, our, you know, I'll, I'll make some statements. There's some, there's some narrative, I got a lot to say. Um, but there's some narrative that I want to add to uh, what it is that we're dealing with. And, and if you will, add some color to the conversation uh, that we're having here. Um, I'm inviting you out as well. And, and it doesn't make any difference what you look like. Um, it's good to see Central Vermont in the house. Um, but we'd love to hear uh, from you as well. I think I have um, a, a statement, at least a partial statement, also from the mother uh, of the child as well, uh, and um, and I think there's um, there's an exchange that I, I want to share with you as far as some of the conversations uh, that we had, and I just and I'm gonna just paint a picture, if you will, of what I call just a, a horrible Nimini Snicket story, just in general, just the whole thing. So is, is that is that fair enough? Is everybody is everybody up for that? Everybody down for that? But before I do that, um, I, I got a. We used to sing a song when I when I was when I was with the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for a Moral Revival, and it went kind of like this. And um, just listen to what I'm saying, just for a minute, okay? And then maybe if you can sing, if you can't, shut up. But if you can sing, maybe you can sing along. With, no, you can sing. You can sing with it. Um, and it goes, it goes like this. It says, "Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's going on." Far too long, it's gone on far too long, it's gone on far too long. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't 
be silent anymore. Anybody ever heard that before? Sing it with me one time. Say, somebody, somebody's hurt my brother and is gone on. Oh, it's gone on far too long. And hell, it is gone on far too long. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother and it's gone on far too long. And we won't, and we won't be silent anymore. Somebody's hurting my sister. See you when we go pick it up a little bit. My sister, somebody's hurting my sister and it's gone on. You know that it's gone on far too long. You know that it's gone on far too long. I said that somebody's hurting my sister and it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. I said we, we won't be silent anymore. You gotta, you gotta have that dramatic ending to it, okay? And we won't be silent anymore. Give yourself a hand. Just give yourself a hand. So, first up, um, I just wanted to share just part of the press release with you. Uh, how many people have read the press release? How many people? Okay, so this is for those of you who haven't. <laughs> right? That makes sense. So listen, um, this, is, um, this is dated January 31st. Uh, the contact is Stephanie Gomery, the communications director at the ACLU. For those of you who are here, our brothers and sisters in the press, thank you for coming too. I appreciate y'all. For, for showing up. Press. Give it up for the press. So, <clears throat> the parent of a Burlington teenager uh, filed a lawsuit against the city of Burlington yesterday alleging discriminatory unconstitutional treatment by city officials. The case stems from an encounter in which the Burlington police and the paramedics needlessly escalated an interaction with this child, used excessive force, and injected him with ketamine and forcibly removed him from his bedroom and home, a black teenager with, an undocumented, with a documented history of complex trauma and behavior and intellectual disabilities. This 14-year-old at the time, he was, he was 14 years old at the time of the incident. Now, first of all, on his face, that's a shame. On his face, that's a shame. How many people believe that? Can I go on, can I keep reading? Um, so here's here's a, just a couple of comments that that uh, came from it. This is from the ACLU staff attorney Hillary Rich, who's covering this case. It says, "Quote: This is from Hillary. She said, as we've seen too many times before, Burlington police escalated a routine encounter with violence and then refused to take responsibility for the harm they caused. Instead, blaming the victim. When community members are urging that more be done to address racial and disability discrimination in policing and reduce the footprint of law enforcement in over-police communities. This is exactly what they want to prevent. This is exactly what they want to prevent. Uh, when the officers entered this person's room, he was sitting calmly on his bed and eventually relinquished all but one of his vape pens. He did not engage the officers and he presented no danger. The officers could have simply issued a citation and walked away. The officers could have simply issued a citation and walked away. Instead, um, despite their knowledge of this person's disabilities and condition, they threatened with an arrest and handcuffing if he did not produce the final item. And although the officers could have engaged in a number of different de-escalation techniques, including continued verbal engagement, calling a supervisor for guidance, or requesting a clinical uh, clinician for support, the officers abandoned Burlington Police Department policies and instead grabbed the person, forced his arms behind his back, wrestled the pen from his hands, and then when he started to panic, the officers did not disengage. Instead, they handcuffed him and ultimately pinned him to the floor where the teen lay terrified and screaming and contorted himself in distress. Uh, police later, uh, they then summoned the paramedics who did not adequately discuss 
with the mother or the Burlington Police Department the disabilities of uh, and his health needs, it just keeps getting worse. Um, instead, the paramedics, um, they proceeded to wrap the child's head in an opaque mesh bag, or a spit hood is what they call it, further terrifying him. And then um, they labeled his distress as, get this, you should put this one in the books, excited delirium. What is that? Um, sounds like the same thing I, I urged the police commission to keep out of their use of force policy and the same thing I rejected on it was the sole um, dissenter in the passage of the policy back uh, a few years ago, but we'll come back to that. Um, so, yeah, it, here it says that the ACLU says it's an illegitimate diagnosis rejected by the medical community, yet often applied to victims of police violence, especially black men and boys. So there you have it. Uh, so the paramedics, then they, what, they, what they did was they injected him uh, with uh, ketamine. This is a powerful, just in case, how many people know what ketamine is? Wow, you guys are heavy rollers. So, um, so um, the, this is um, a really um, fast-acting anesthetic used to in, induce like loss of consciousness, loss of consciousness. Um, so that that's what they usually use for restraint of um, adults. I said restraint of adults because it's very important to delineate. We're talking about a 14-year-old child, right? So, um, moving on, the, what happened is they then carried the unconscious child out of the home. They carried the unconscious child out of, out of the home. So, um, the mother sought some accountability. She went around, I'm going to let you read the rest of the report, but uh, the rest of the uh, press release. But she did go round and round with the uh, police on a number of occasions, as also with the police commission and um, she didn't get any justice, so there was no peace. Uh, so that's why we are where we are today. Um, now, this is, this is wrong on so many different levels, I don't even know where to start. And, um, I, and uh, for those of you who want uh, to um, just get caught up, because I see that some are, are just walking by, I, I see you, I see you, Grace, I see some, some others who are coming and, and joining us. Um, this is to speak out for those of you who are passing by. We're talking about a 14-year-old black child uh, that was um, restrained in his own home, put a spit hood on him, pinned him down, handcuffed him, shot him up with ketamine, and dragged him out of his house. That's what we're talking about. And somehow or another, um, as I was interacting with some of my colleagues online today, and I was getting feedback from some of them, some people, you know what I got? Somebody told me, they said, well, I don't know what good a speak out is going to do. I don't know why it is that, you know, yeah, we understand that the police, they use excessive force. We understand that it's being done disproportionately to black and brown bodies. And, there's, and currently there is a, a juxtaposition that somehow or another, because everything is so unsafe, because everybody feels so unsafe because public safety is out of control right now and everybody is at risk and every you know and it's everybody feels like like right now we, everything's just out of control so it's okay for us to take this this factor off the table this whole idea that black lives ma that black lives still matter and and just ignore that to me, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just having a problem with that. So anyway, as I'm talking this thing through, I heard a whole lot of comments from a whole lot of people uh, who, who, who basically said they didn't see what the point of this was. But here's the thing. Nobody seemed to have a better answer. Nobody, nobody seemed to have a better answer. So as, as I'm talking, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll introduce a, a couple people who want to have anything to say about this. But you're gonna need to talk to Amina or Jamie. They have the three by five cards. Maybe nobody has anything to say. But as as we were having that conversation today, it occurred to me that to be quiet on something like this, especially something like this, 
to have like absolutely nothing to say because here's what I, here's what we're experiencing and this is what's really going on is is that time after time after time after time after time after time again what we're seeing is is there's there's this ducking and dodging that's going on not just with our police here locally but also across the state where they're avoiding and evading any type of accountability where no matter what seems to happen nobody seems to want to have any type of effective impactful transparent police oversight because every time it comes up, it gets kicked down the road by somebody in this administration or somebody who's, who's on this city council, most of them with, with higher aspirations. But what, they, but what they never really do is come back to the fact that oversight is incredibly important. Now, let me tell you one thing, and I, I'm still in a little bit of my thunder, but I'm here to tell you, and again, this is a speak out, because at the end of the day, we got to call this thing out, Kathy. We got to call this thing out. We, we got we to gotta say what this thing is. Because if we're not talking about it, then who is? If, and, if we're, and if we're not talking about it, then how are we going to ever come together and do anything about it? And if we're not talking about it, then what that means is it's normalized. So as you think about this thing, uh, as you think about the fact that, that, you know, what we're doing is we're putting together task forces. Now, we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about that today, and I'm going to come back to that again. Like I said, I've got a few statements that I want to read, but I want to hear from you, too, because this is your speak out. But as we put together these task forces, what, what's the point? The, the point is, is you have local, you have regional, county, regional, statewide, as well as federal law enforcement agencies all coming together. Not just with their personnel, but with, with all of their technologies, with all of their surveillance systems, with all of their command and control, and so forth, and, and creating strategies to crack down on the war on drugs. To do more of the same thing that they've been doing the entire time, understanding that it never works out very well, at least for some of us. And I think the long and short of my concerns of this, this is my speak out, is, is to, to and, and this is not just in the city of Burlington or across this region, but we have statewide task forces, sister. We have statewide task forces with all of, with all of this collective power, with all of this, these collective resources, the financial resources, the economic resource, but also the technological resources that span across the, the entire state. So what they're doing is they're in, they're in, there is an influx of money as well as responsibility and, of, and the scope of authority is growing while at the same time, the oversight of it is diminishing. So what that is, is that is a perfect recipe, if you will, a perfect recipe for wreaking havoc once again in, on black and brown bodies in this city across this state. How many people believe that? Somebody say no. Somebody say no. no. 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 We, won't we won't have it. Say no. no. We won't have it. We won't have See, somebody's got, somebody's got to say no. See, we, we're so busy sitting at home watching all of this stuff go by, go by us, but nobody seems to want to say anything. Why? Fear. Fear of loss. Fear that we won't be able to gain something. That we don't want to confront somebody. We don't want to talk to our family or our friends about this because we'll have an unpopular opinion. We might lose a friend, lose a family member, lose a job, or have somebody talk about us. Or we, 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 meanwhile, what we can do, what we do is we go home and rest and be white. But at the end of the day, black lives still matter. So when we go back to this youth and we think about what happened with him, everybody that I talked to, they said two things. They, they said, number one, this is appalling. Number two, what's number two? I'm not surprised. Every single person that I've spoken to about this has said, I'm not surprised that this happened. So what, what, what we're really talking about is, is that this is being normalized. We've got to speak out. 
on this. We got to call this thing out. We're also, there's an intersection of disabilities. Come on, folks. This kid, this is a disabled, a kid with eight, eight ADHD in his home. So we're going to talk about a couple of other things, that I, but I, and I want to read a couple of statements, but I want to hear from you. Bef before I hear from you, though, there, I, I've, got to, I've got to go here, because right now what you have to understand is across the state of Vermont, this is a speak out, so I'm going to say what I'm thinking, okay? Across the state of Vermont, black children are being removed from homes at highly disproportionate rates. Across this entire state, the DCF system, there is an attack, just like the criminal justice system, on black adult bodies. There is an attack on black young bodies across this entire state. Department of Children and Family are removing our children from these homes at highly disproportionate rates. And with a 93.8% white population in Vermont, they are ending up in white homes. Period. And that is a part of this problem. This child was adopted at five, so a uh, five months old. So let's, let's talk about the whole problem because this child is a product of an interracial couple 17, 18 years ago and was removed from that home. So in order for us to do the analysis on what it is that we need to be talking about and what we're actually speaking out about, what we got to do is we got to rely on the grace of God to be able to give us the wisdom to slow down enough for a minute and look at the whole problem. So we're not just talking about law enforcement, although they should have efficient, impactful, and transparent oversight, hard stop. But there is also a, a, an issue that we need to be looking at with the Department of Children and Families and the disproportionate rate in which they're removing black children. And how do we, and let's not just talk about the problem, let's talk about the solution because we've been talking about that for a while. So tomorrow, we're gonna be, again, this is I think our third month, we'll be at the Richard Kemp Center at four o'clock and we'll be having more conversations about uh, public safety and we call it community health and wellness so come, come down to the Richard Kemp Center tomorrow. We'll have more of that conversation. Today, what we're talking about, though, what we're talking about is, is how could it be that a 14-year-old black child could have a police officer roll up into their house, restrain them, call the paramedics, shoot them up with ketamine, and drag them out? How could that be? How is that okay? Why is everybody still walking by? Why is everybody turning their TV off? Why is nobody talking about that? Why is nobody talking about the fact that this was an interracial child who was placed in a white home and she called the police? Why is it nobody's talking about that he needed help way before this? We need to empower ourselves. We, we, it, it's up to us as community to be able to position ourselves to create the programs and service to care for these youth, to care for these, these black and brown youth that are in these white homes. That's our job. They're not, obviously what's going on right now, they can't, they're not doing it. And it's, it's, it's insanity for us to think that if we keep going back to that same apparatus and expecting different results, that we're gonna get something different. It's up to us. As far as who's supporting that white woman who called the police. That's up to us. And, let me, and let, let me be perfectly clear about her. She dropped the ball. She screwed the pooch. There's no way in your military mind that, that anybody here, there, or anywhere needs to be calling the police on somebody black any time of the day, even if it is your kid, period. And if you don't understand that as a, as a white person with black children in your home, you better wake up right now. Because what you're doing is you're assigning a death warrant for that child or anybody else. And if you threaten that, then we ought to be calling the police on you. And if, if, if it's within my power at, at any time in the near future, we'll make the laws to make that happen. It's a, enough is enough where you got white people calling the police on black folks just because they don't feel safe. Come on. Knowing what that apparatus has done since 1850. Chasing slaves. Somebody ought to wake up. So yeah, it got real. 
But this is a speak out. I can do that. So listen, we'll talk. We'll go back to the ACL, the uh, NAACP statement in just a minute. I'm going to put the mic down for a second and see whether or not we had anybody sign up for um, for comments. I'll be right back. We got, we got anybody? Anybody? Where's my assistant? They went in to warm up. Doesn't look like anybody wants to say anything. Any, you got any cards over there? No? Come on, come on, come on, come on. What's your name? What? I got Emily Langster. Somebody give it up for Emily Langster. Yes. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Come on, give it up for Emily Langster. Yeah, Go ahead. I, I have personal lived experience of having a teenager who struggled with mental health issues. And um, and uh, it's very difficult and re-traumatizing to hear of this. My son is white, and um, I had to think to myself, thank God my son isn't black, because he would have been so treated so much worse if he had been black. But th the reality is, the mental health system in this state is broken. The police system in this state is broken. The prison system in this state is broken. And they're all, um, they're all intertwined with an extremely dysfunctional um, uh, protocol that does, not, does nothing to restore a de-escalate situation and does everything to punish the victims who, who are struggling with mental illness in this very difficult time that we're living in right now. Uh, it's so broken. And um, so I really think so much needs to be fixed and we need to develop the tools to fix it. Hey, listen, uh, I got up. I want to remind folks who are here that we are doing, you know, there, some of this has to do with the programs and services that are necessary that we need to get out in front of our youth. Um, to, for those of you who have kids and folks who are watching, uh, we're, we do First Friday with the youth out at, at Spare Time. So send the, kids, send the kids out to Spare Time this evening. So directly after this, we'll be at Spare Time with the youth. Uh, we have a blast. Them, them kids is all over the walls out there. So that's one of the things we got. You got to. How many people believe you got to do more than one thing to solve these challenges that we're talking about? You got to do more than one thing. Got to do more than one thing. So I, I mentioned already that tomorrow we're going to meeting at we're going to be meeting at 4 p.m. Hey, you who are walking by, hi. This is a speak out. You just walk through a speak out. This we're speaking out about some um, some some law enforcement uh, oversight, and we're also talking about Department of Children and Family and disproportionate rate at which black youth are being removed from the home. And we're talking about um, Black Lives Matter. We're talking about that as well. I don't mind saying that. I'm Reverend Mark Hughes, the Executive Director of Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, and I just um, I think the first thing that's so important in this conversation, you know, in you know, as as fiery as it gets and as passionate as we get about what it is that we're talking about, it's important to know and understand that for those of us who stand for justice, for those for those of us who are here um, to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly in this place, what what happens is is that there we're going to always have opposition. And what that means is, is that um, we need to be just as forceful with that opposition. This, I think, I think some of us are just too doggone nice these days, you know. And I got a lot of like, I got a lot of nice liberal friends, but but we need, but we need to not be so nice. And when we're having these conversations, because literally there's so many people that are suffering and so many people that are dying, and I think that. You know, having a speak out like this, this is healthy. I mean, I think I don't think we do this enough. You know what I mean? I don't think we do this enough where we say, you know what? That's wrong. Let's talk about it. 
That's wrong. Let's talk about it. I'm going to give you one little uh, story, and then I'm gonna, we're going to come up to Reverend uh, Johnson. Um, and that is, um, Reverend Johnson, I'm going to go with Jake Schumann first, though, okay? Um, so I, was, I, was, I had some youth in the Richard Kim Center because we have a uh, movie night in the Richard Kim Center um, on the second and fourth uh, Fridays. Yeah. And um, we were playing um, Red Light, Green Light. And um, I was in charge. And, uh, and I turned around and I caught one of the kids and I said, that's it, you're out. I saw you moving. And the kid said, no. And I said, you're out. And, he, and the kid said, I'm not leaving. And I said, you can't play. They, they said, you can't make me leave. So we came to this impasse. So the only way that I could figure out how to deal with that without beating them, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the only way that I could figure out how to deal with that to say, okay, it doesn't make any difference what you do. I'm just going to ignore you. We'll continue to play. You can do whatever you want to do. So after each, mo after each movement in the game, I would, I would you know, turn around, ah, oh, everybody's fine, or, oh, I caught you. But to the other one, I would just look at them and say, Hmm. And I would just, you know, continue to play the game. Why did I just tell you that? What I'm trying to get at is, is we're at a place in our society right now. We're at a place in our society right now where it's the norm. It's been normalized where some people just don't play by the rules. And our kids are getting it. Some people just don't play by the rules. And nobody calls them wrong. Nobody says that they're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Some, and and, and it's, it's bleeding over into our children. Some people, adults who are leaders, folks who are, who've been elected, they're not playing by the rules. And we're looking right at them. And nobody's saying, hey, you're out. You lose. And as a result, because we're not speaking out, because we're not showing up and speaking out, we got total mayhem to the extent where I got to go to the Richard Kim Center and look at a little kid and try to figure out how to deal with them because they're out in red light, green light, and I don't know what the hell to do with them. We got to speak out. We got to speak out. Somebody say, speak out. Speak out. Speak out. Speak out. Mr. Schumann. Jake Schumann. Give it up for Jake. Jake! <laughs> hey, um, so I know there's cameras, so get your bleeper ready. I'm fucking pissed off about this. Like, a lot. Um, Mark, you, you, you asked the rhetorical question, like, why do people just keep walking by? Why do people just keep scrolling? Nobody pays attention to this. I think the easy out for people is, well, I don't know about that. Like, I don't, I don't know all the details. I don't know what's going on there. But let me tell you, I do. I fucking know what's going on here. 2021 to 2022, that academic year, I worked in the DCF policy and planning office. I am a registered and licensed EMT. I have been working for years on the police oversight issue in this town. So I have the expertise. I can tell you every single level of this was wrong. Those paramedics, they deserve to lose their licenses. That doctor deserves to lose their license. Some of you might have read the seven days article that said that there's nothing in the EMS protocols that talks about um, using ketamine on a child. The EMS protocols in Vermont, that is called standing orders. That's a list of all the things that you are allowed to do. If there's something that's not in there, it means you can't fucking do it. Whoa. You can't do it. Duh. It's a, it's medical malpractice. Yep. Um, so I'm just really pissed off about this. And, uh, you know, it, it's not just cops. It's not just, it's also EMS. We need oversight of our medical system, right? We need oversight of DCF. DCF is a quasi-legal process. 
It's quasi-judicial. Did you know that family court is secret? You can't find out what happened there. They can, they can just take your kids. Um, you know, my current project that I'm working on with some friends is to start a new Vermont diaper bank. So every month, 150 beautiful brown, black, and a couple white babies get diapers. And, and I get to like have that experience with community, um, you know, mutual aid, providing for each other. And when we don't pay attention, when we don't speak out, that is us failing each other. We are not showing up for each other. Like, Palestinian Solidarity Rally, yes. that shit's rad. Yes. But there were, there's three, 400 people there every single time. Where are the people now? This is important. People need to show up for everything. Um, so I'll just leave you on this one thought. For four years, we have been asking for an opportunity to vote on a police oversight and accountability, anything, just anything. Can we please get something that we can, the people, voice our opinion on? Just two weeks ago, Joan Shannon, who is running for mayor, introduced a poison pill amendment, poison pill amendment, so that we cannot vote on police oversight once again for yet another time. Y'all need to please, please, I'm begging you, everyone, please, do you understand how important this mayoral race is? It is an inflection point. If the next mayor is mayor for 12 years, then this is the race that will determine whether Burlington exists in 12 years. Please mobilize, organize. It's only five weeks. You just, it's five weeks of hard work, but please put in that hard work. Everyone show up with everything you got. We got to break this cycle. Thank you. Hey, hey. I got, I got some, um, I got some Bernie mittens from Kathy. She, she, she said, yo, your hands look cold. So, hey, I, I wanna just share something with you and um, Reverend Johnson, if you can head up this way, um, you're next. Um, here's, a, um, here's, a, here's a statement, can you help me? Can you just like help me look through these papers here? Yeah. I'm looking for a statement from me. NAACP. Oh, there it is. So I just got a quick statement from the NAACP, and then I want to introduce you to uh, uh, Reverend Johnson. Uh, the, the, um, the Rutland NAACP stands resolute against a disturbing incident involving this uh, young black teenager subjected to discriminatory and unconstitutional treatment by the Burlington Police Department. This reprehensible act is, is not an isolated incident. Thank you. But part of uh, a distressing pattern that echoes the broader challenges faced by marginalized communities in their interactions with law enforcement. It's disheartening that despite repeated calls for reform, the Burlington Police Department continues to demonstrate a disregard for the lives and the well-being of people of color, particularly those with disabilities. The ACLU's revelation of the historical discriminatory practices within the department coupled with the unwarranted uh, use of force against this young person reinforces the urgent need for a compre com comprehensive changes in policing methodologies and oversight and furthermore the um, misuse of ketamine a powerful anesthetic uh, on a minor contradicts established protocols and raises serious ethical concerns. The Redland NAACP calls for a thorough investigation into the medical procedures employed during the incident, emphasizing the importance of adherence to ethical standards when dealing with vulnerable individuals, especially those with uh, documented disabilities. We demand transparency, accountability, and immediate action from the Burlington city officials to rectify uh, this egregious violation of human rights. Thank you. Uh, the community deserves assurances that steps are being taken 
to address the root causes such incidents um, of such incidents and to implement meaningful reforms that prioritize safety, equality, and justice for everybody. The Rutland NAACP echoes the sentiments of the victim's family, affirming that every parent regardless of their child's abilities or race, should be able to seek assistance without fearing unwarranted violence. We stand united with them in their pursuit of justice and healing, urging the city of Burlington to acknowledge its failures and work collaboratively with effective communities to build a fair and a just system. The Rutland NAACP remains steadfast in its commitment to eradicating racial injustices and advocating for systemic changes that promote equity, inclusivity, and accountability in all facets of social of society, rather particularly within our law enforcement agencies. The time for transformation is now. That's the uh, Rutland NAACP, okay? So, again, what we're what we're talking about here is we're talking about we're talking about the um, you know we're talking about where there, there's been like so many missteps that you know you can't you can't even really number them the missteps that have um, that they that the that the uh, police department um, are, that have they have to be held responsible they haven't they've yet to take accountability for it that's the reason why the litigation is ensued. Uh, it's ongoing. They've never stepped up. They've never said, hey, this is the deal. You know, we're sorry about that. Let's just move on. Let's get to. So it, as far as we can tell, what they're saying is, is hey, it was all protocol. It's the way we do it. Right. No policy was violated or nothing like that. So it's a problem. We, we need to we need to get that figured out. However, I think it's more important to understand that it's not just a problem, but it's a pattern, not just for the Burlington Police Department, but for policing in general, particularly as it pertains to black bodies. That's really where we're going with this. That's why I'm here. Okay, that's why I'm here. So this is a speak out. Uh, let me introduce Reverend Karen Johnson. Thank you, Reverend Mark. I really appreciate that you have gathered people together, and though I know our hearts and our minds wish that there were more people and we invite more people to be here, I am, I am so thankful for the chance to be here, for this chance to say transformation now. Can you say transformation now? Transformation now. It must come now. When I hear the words of the Rutland NAACP, I know that transformation must come now. I, I heard Reverend Mark talk about his con his conversation earlier with colleagues who questioned why why show up for a speak out what is going to change what is going to happen and I think then of the words a story that um, Dr. Imani Perry told I don't know if you know her she's an uh, African American author she teaches at Princeton University and she spoke to my faith community Unitarian Universalists last June but she tells a story of how after yet another another black man was shot by the police and killed that she went forward with her two young sons and she wondered and they wondered why were we going out what was going to change because we went out to yet another protest another vigil and the thing that she said that has stayed with me is that she couldn't promise her children as much as she wanted to that going to the protest would make any difference but that seeing that they were not alone that we are not alone that when when we gather, whether it's just one or two other people, but when we gather, and when we gather across races, across genders, across all the ways in which we are different and beautiful, that is one thing that we need. We need in moments like this when there is no accountability, when there is a flag flying that speaks a deep truth but that is not being lived into, we must gather together because love is what justice looks like in, per in public. That's what Dr. West has said over and over again. It is how I try to live my life. Love is what justice looks like in public and we love to it doesn't just happen. It happens when we embody it, when we come across each other. I'm relatively new to Burlington. I'm relatively new to Vermont. I have to tell you, as a white person, I am shocked at the seething hostility towards people of color around this state. It's amazing. And, I, and not in a good way, right? And I just think even peop, white people, 
who, right? I am white, white people, my people, like who think they are doing well. There is so much that is clumsy and comes across as hostile and it has to change. And then when that happens and then there is this whole pattern of police brutality, lack of accountability here, it is just an epitome of the worst that happens. But if we show up, we can be a part of the change. And if we don't show up, it will not happen. So let us be love what justice looks like in public. Thank you so much, good to see you. You know, threatening a 14-year-old black boy with jail, uh, restraining him, pinning him, cuffing him, tranquilizing him. Like I said, it's, it's deeply troubling, but it's just not surprising. No, it's not. That's, that's the problem. That's the problem. It's, it's, it's troubling, but it's just not surprising. Black people, we know well that the biggest threat to our lives is the institution of policing. And what we see here, this is not a broken system. The system is not broken. This is not a bug in the system. This is a feature. It's uh, systematically, um, this, is, this is the racist system. Um, this is um, this is a situation where we, we've we've tried repeatedly to get oversight here, and currently right now, if you go out to our uh, website um, and just you can you can follow the some of you receive our our mail our mailing list. You should have received an email blast today or yesterday, um, but there's a, a a legislative agenda called Do to Work. Uh, and what we're doing is we're calling on the oversight, the legislative oversight committee of the House Government Operations to implement um, some impactful and transparent and productive uh, police oversight across all uh, 79 agencies across the state. So, because if we can't do it here, um, just like we normally do, if we can't get it done in Burlington, we'll get it done in the state, and it'll, and we'll, you, Burlington will just come along uh, kicking and screaming, but we'll get it done. I promise you that. Okay, uh, just we've got one other speaker, and then I've got um, I've got a um, an exchange that I want to share with you that I had with the um, the mother of the child, uh, my sister, uh, Catherine Kemp. I said my sister. You can clap louder than that. So I I think that I've walked through my life with um, a sense of hope. And I was raised by Richard Kemp, who believed and taught us that if you're not part of the prob part of the solution, you're probably part of the problem. So one of the things I've done in my life is I stepped up. Um, I've been acquainted with DCF. I've been at all sides of the table. And when the strife was waning, I decided to step up and become a foster parent. I decided to step up as a black parent to try to help care for these children so they didn't end up in white houses where the parents don't know what the hell they're doing. And they're doing damage to these kids of color. So I got so involved that I became a paid trainer of foster parents, okay? So I got in the room to talk to these white parents. I think there was one black parent that ever showed up. So there's opportunity there. Mm -hmm. But I got in the room and I said, we're gonna talk about race. You got your binder running you through all the things you might, ha might happen when you have a foster kid in your house. Nobody, they weren't talking about race at all. So we started talking about race. And then years later, I said, well, I can't foster kids. And well, I fostered a child. I adopted that child. And I can't do that anymore. But what I'm doing now is respite work. I am helping the foster families get a break and take kids when I can. So it's a break for everybody, all right? So hope, provide hope, step up work with DCF in whatever capacity you might be able to do, and, and think about helping to provide safe homes of color for these children, okay? 
Step up. You don't have to be an angel. That's bullshit. You don't have to have magic powers. You have to have a heart and you have to care. And if you want to talk about doing that work, see me. I will introduce you to the process and you can do it well. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to pick up these papers with those gloves on. Oh, come on. Got it. So, um, wanted to share with you just uh, some comments uh, from the uh, parent of the child and also wanted to share with you some thoughts because really what we're when we start to speak out how many people believe that when we start to speak out not only does it give us a release not only does it hold those uh, who, who have the political and the economic power accountable but it also begins to bring us together that's really what this speak out is all about. It's about how do we begin to process? How do we begin to start creating healthy patterns where we begin to come together and have constructive conversations? And how do we, how do we come together and, and create solutions for some of these challenges that we're dealing with here? I'm telling you, the, um, the um, criminal justice system, law enforcement in general, but the uh, criminal justice system, um, the truth is, is it is a beast. You know, and we're not we're not here we're, we're not here to take it down or anything like that. And we're not we're not we're, what we're not going to do is is destroy some type of institution because it's not happening. We cannot burn it down. We got to figure out how do we work through some of these things. We got to figure out how do we introduce transformational transformational activities that are how do we work in con conjunction with them to create programs and services in our own communities how do we take responsibility for some of those how do we create inside and outside strategies with folks who are inside of these systems so we can work together for for common solutions these are some of the things that, and more that we're going to start talking that we're going to continue to talk about in some of the sessions that we're doing on a monthly basis that's the first saturday of every month at 4 p.m and yes tomorrow is is that and that's at the Richard Kemp Center so I want to invite you to that okay here's a what I'll leave you with is is uh, and I just a little little commentary after that is is a statement here's some words from the mother of the child she said I'm very grateful to the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance for holding this speak out and to all listening I made a promise to my son to seek accountability and find justice for the harm done to him. Unfortunately, my son's story sadly is not unique, as devastating as the details of this trauma has, was, and is. Man, I wish I had some tissue. Anybody have any tissue? Everybody sticks their hands in their pockets. Somebody comes up here with a snotty rag, right? Narcan falling out, right? <laughs> Thanks, thank you, thank you. Oh, we're good, you're good, you're good. So, thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, my son's story is not unique as devastating as the details of this trauma was and is. His experience as, as, a, as a black youth was the direct result of the actions of the Burlington Police Department, they created a medical emergency that stems for lack of training, oversight, and racial bias. No parent should have to witness their child become a victim at the hands of law enforcement. As his mother, I was unable to protect my son in our own house. And she goes on to, uh, she goes on to um, suggest that we join in seeking change, and she does begin to lay out what she believes some of our uh, demands ought to be, but I'm not going to share them uh, with you because um, I'm going to sh first share you my response to her email because she and I had spoken prior to this, and I had intentionally asked her 
well, we had an extensive discussion about the fact that she called the police, which is a, a huge problem, a big problem. And, um, and also just how devastatingly harmful that that is on, on every case. And what I used during that conversation was as an analogy I kind of shared with her, my thoughts and my feelings around January 6, 2001. And when I was watching on CNN, the capital of the United States being ransacked and hearing that there was a distinct possibility that there were white supremacist factions that were gonna do the same thing in this state and that there was a possibility that this was gonna happen again I'm gonna tell you, I was scared. And I was confused. And there was no one I could call. Because what I knew was it would be more dangerous for me to call the police. So what I shared with her at that time was the fact that this is a constant challenge that black people have all of the time and at that level if you if you can get your head around that and you probably can't but if you can just get your head around that then you come to understand how important it is that you do not call the police so after that conversation I did get that email back from her and, and she there are some things that she uh, politely asked me to omit in the conversation and I'm respecting that um, but my response to her was, is, thanks for reaching out. The conversation that we had yesterday was accentuated by your specific request that it not be revealed. And I went on to talk about what that was in the conversation that I had with the ACLU. ACLU. Um, and um, I, said, I said, though I paid you the courtesy of reaching out prior to this event, it's bigger than you, me, or your son. Our main thrust is on white supremacy culture and systems that always treat black bodies as less than. I hope that you would have acknowledged the role that you played in the situation, if for no other reason to not come off as being blind to the error made in the situation regardless of your intent. It would have served to teach other white folks that are raising black children around the state and beyond. Sadly, I don't see that here. This is not, I said this will not be lost on me in speaking publicly about this matter in that its omission would do great disservice to every single one of us. Finally, the transformation, not change, that we seek as black folks in Burlington and across Vermont must be front and foremost communicated during this process, not yours. To do otherwise only feeds into patterns of white supremacy culture and further perpetuates what we are experiencing with policing and the Department of Children and Families in moving forward. Note, if you have any last minute thoughts or words or expressions on lessons learned on the decision that you made to call the police, I'm still willing to share them to the extent that you'd like to provide them. I received nothing further from her before this meeting. So, Thanks for coming to the speak out tonight. What we will do is we're going to continue to have these kinds of conversations. This, I believe, for those of you who are interested in joining us in this work, then you can meet up with some of our folks. Where do our folks go? We still got folks here. There's a, there's a, a sign up sheet right over there. You can find us also online. Uh, or you can just stop in at the Richard Kemp Center tomorrow at 4 p.m. 
and we're going to continue this conversation. This is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. Guys, have a great weekend.